ladies and gentlemen, broadcasting from Brooklyn, New York, the epicenter of cool, you're listening to the Bruce Montalvo Show. Thank you for joining us, folks. It is All Hallows Eve. That's right, All Hallows Eve. The kids are getting ready to go out and dress up as ghouls, and we are going to bring you one horrifying yet enlightening show tonight with a very special guest. This man is very influential to my work, folks. He really needs no introduction. We have him on the line right now, a legendary researcher and scholar, Jordan Maxwell. Let's go to the phone lines and see if he's joined us. Jordan, are you there? Oh, hello, Jordan. Hello. Excellent. We're broadcasting live now. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for joining us on All Hallows Eve. I love Halloween too. Time of year, and uh, it's quite an interesting time when you go back into history and see where all of this ideas and belief systems have come from. It's a Celtic Druid celebration, but much of what we uh, <clears throat> in the Western world do is Celtic and Druid. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, Jordan. I heard you state in a recent interview you stated that words are actually spells. And I thought to myself, this couldn't be more true. Do you know of any words that put together can resonate to form the power of, let's say, a spell or a curse? Well, I mean, there's books galore have been written on words that are used in rituals and, and seances and all that kind of thing. I don't really look at the world of the occult to learn from it. I look to learn about it. And so I, I look at all of the world of the occult, but I'm not really interested in it, trying, you know, trying any of it, or looking right. at the specific uh, uh, terms and words which are used in rituals. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in the general overall concept of words, you know, how humans form words. And like I said, you form a, a word with a spell or you spell it, and so um, words can be used to deceive, Can words are very deadly, as a matter of fact, you put an S in front of the word, word, and it becomes sword. Wow. So, uh, you know, swords are very deadly, you can, you can defend yourself with the words, or you can kill somebody's spirit with a word, you can and do all kinds of damage with Absolutely. your, your words. Absolutely. And, and Jordan, if you add another S to just the word S, you get an SS, right? That was very evil, too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they, and they're still with us today, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to expand upon that later on in the broadcast. But just to talk about words and how you said even to say a word, you have to spell it. I mean, a curse word, a word of curse, right? I mean, it's... Yeah. It's got some significance there. That's right. And, you know, words are even used backwards. You know, we, we, we use words backwards and not even realizing it. Like today, we have something in the Middle East called the Suez Canal. Right. Uh, Suez backwards is, uh, is Zeus. Wow. And Zeus spelled backwards is Suez. And uh, so Amazing. We, we take these ancient words, ancient gods, ancient concepts, and, uh, you know, spray paint them and lacquer them all up and sell them to um, the, the public today, and people have no idea where these words have come from and how far back they go and what they mean. And um, one thing I think is so important that I know that virtually, virtually nobody sees. There are a few people who are enlightened enough to, to realize and see things. That's an interesting word, to realize. Uh, to make something real so you truly understand it. That's and right. one thing that most people don't realize 
and truly understand is that this world that we live in, this earth that we live on, is is um, is filled with. Hold on, just a minute. Hold on. Let me. Uh, I'm getting phone calls from all over the, the place. Oh, you're you're very popular okay. today on All Hallows Eve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got two other shows to do tonight after yours. So, yeah, well, thank you very much for being on, Jordan. It's it's uh, All right. um, incredible to have you on. Okay, and uh, hold on just a minute. Hold on. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It is All Hallows Eve. We're joined with a amazing guest. This is literally the Super Bowl of symbolism going down right now. Uh, Jordan Maxwell, occult researcher, just a uh, scholar extraordinaire, joining us on the phone talking about okay, yeah. words. Sorry. Uh, and he's back. Hey, Jordan, uh, we're talking about the power of words. Uh, what What do you mean by the power of words? I'm stating that, but just do you mean that just by saying something a certain way you can manifest it, whether good or bad? Well, uh, what I was going to say, and... Uh because when you mouth a word, it's a vibration. Yes. And, uh, and so vibrations are very important. That's the way so many things have gotten done. As a matter of fact, the Hindus say that's the way the whole world got here, by vibration. So, but what I was going to say is that uh, there is a magical system which is uh, promoted by and feted by and, and, and caused by a spiritual presence uh, on the earth. I don't know how far out into space it may go and where it may have come from, and there may be a lot bigger story there, but for the earth and for us, there is a spiritual presence on this earth. Absolutely. Which is highly intelligent, which can be extremely evil, very, very, very... <clears throat> very uh, destructive and evil, but it's intelligent, and it is not a nebulous thing. It is actually individual personalities in the spirit world. And so, uh, just because you don't see them does not mean that they don't exist. Absolutely. Now, the, Absolutely. Ancient peoples call them, ancient peoples call them, like in the... Um, in the Islamic world, they're called jinns. Right. Uh, you know, Christians call them angels or demons and devils. Uh, today, we scientifically we talk about poltergeists and uh, and uh, spirits, dark spirits. But these, whoever and whatever this is that we're talking about, which is not of our world does coexist with us on this planet. Uh, we most, uh, unfortunately, humans go about their daily life uh, doing what they do and do not see uh, the, the presence of other, of other life forms here. Oh, they're completely here oblivious. Yeah, totally oblivious. And, uh, and so, so much of what is going on in the world today, the chaos and the, and the uh, you know, and the demonic stuff that's happening with murder and violence and raping and pillaging and, and the destruction of human life is all being orchestrated by some things or some ones which are not of our physical world. Now, let's, let's talk about that, Jordan, because today is a very special broadcast, All Hallows' Eve. All Hallows' Eve, to me, is Halloween, it's Samhain, it's these druidical uh, just uh, rituals. Now, I'm thinking Halloween goes way back. I mean, it's in Old English, All Hallows means the Feast of the Saints. But literally, I mean, this goes back to ancient, uh, the Aztec, where they had Quetzalcoatl, the, the reptile snake god. They had that, and then they had the Egyptians and their beliefs of the netherworld and life after death and of reincarnation. Course, all, of them, all of them did, including the Mexicans today. Once a year, they have their Dia celebrations about the uh, when they uh, celebrate the dead 
and it's the day of the dead where they are able to uh, communicate with their dead ancestors, and it's a special day, just like similar to a Halloween. And it continues. It continues today, right, Jordan? I mean, do you think that the children trick or treating symbolizes basically like child sacrifice? I mean, literally dressing them up for the golden sacrificial bull, the oh, ancient yeah, deity. All of that is connected. All of it's connected. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite sure there's a lot of that too. Wow. Uh, but uh, but also the idea of the trick or treat was uh, also encompasses the idea that the spirits, some of them are good and some of them are bad, and some of them are very bad, and some of them are extremely good. But uh, but with the spirit entities, whoever they are, are dealing with us in the in the physical world. Uh, they could be very, very mischievous and be very vindictive and trick you and make you think that they are your friend Then, at the last moment trick you and laugh at you from the other side of the veil that right. you don't see them. And so it's like a trick or treat. And the idea was that you serve the spirits and, and, uh, and maybe, maybe they will be good to you. Maybe they will do something good for you. But don't count on it. Most likely, it's going to be a trick instead of a treat. Absolutely. And so um, we still, like I said, we still honor those those ideas and concepts because there's something to it. There right. really is something to it. Have Have you ever seen any ghosts, Jordan? Well, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of things. Yes, I, I I don't know if I would call them ghosts. Right. I've seen I've seen spirits many times. I've seen spirits. In my bedroom, I've seen some incredible wow. things with my own eyes that uh, I don't like to talk about because people are going to immediately uh, assume you're crazy. Well, I'll tell you this, Jordan. I got a story for you since when it's Halloween, and I've heard a lot of your stories. Of, I've followed your career for a while, but here's one of mine. Uh, I was traveling to Austin, Texas, and uh, in the sky, I saw a huge apparition would look like a a horned bull formed out of a cloud formation. Now, I I try to reason with myself, like, man, it was just a cloud formation. But then I I went and I looked it up, and warning clouds are actually in, in the Bible. They speak of clouds of warning. So to me, it, it, it looked exactly like the horned bull, Moloch. It, it really freaked me out. That's a story, a scary story yeah. from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, well... I'm sure things like that happen all the time. In a ghost there's town, a, too. It was in a ghost yeah. town. Uh, there's a book out that you really need to know about. And, and anyone who's interested in there's not very few, there's not many people who are interested in the world of the occult, the dark world right. that, that they don't see. Not many people are interested in that because it has nothing to do with anything of real importance like uh, Paris Hilton or the ball games of basketball or anything that's important to people nowadays. But if you are if you are a little bit above that mentality and you realize that there's something going on in the universe that doesn't include you, you need to get a book called um, The Complete Works of Charles Fort, F-O-R-T. Hmm. The Complete Works of Charles Fort, F-O-R-T. Uh, that is the most extraordinary book. It was given to me by uh, by someone who was not of this world back in 1959 when I was first come to California. Wow. When I was 19 years old. And uh, I'm just telling you that it's the most extraordinary book you're ever going to read about the world of the occult. Because what this man did, Charles Ford, very famous in his day, he took, um, he went to libraries all over New York and God knows where, everywhere else, and he collected all of the stories uh, <clears throat> and documented and footnoted all of the stories of things which have happened on this earth in which there was no explanation, period. That's important strange phenomena and things which have happened on the earth in which there is no possible explanation at all. And therefore, science does not touch it, 
scientists don't even look at it because there's no way to explain it. And therefore, if a scientist were to look at the facts of what actually happened and not know how it happened and not be able to explain it, he'd look like an idiot. Absolutely. So therefore, therefore, uh, instead of showing yourself to be stupid, don't even look at it. This way, you don't have to look like a moron because you don't understand what's going on. <laughs> don't even ex look at it. Turn your head and look the other way and act like it never happened. And now you can go on and present yourself to the world as one of the great world world's authorities on something. Because if you look the, of the things that have happened that there's no explanation for at all, you're going to look like what you actually are, a dimwit who is like, parading himself around as a scientist. Absolutely, Jordan. So, now I'll tell you, I'm going to look into that book by a fort, but I tell you, a book that doesn't leave, uh, basically leave my desk ever is a book that you helped co-author and it was Symbols, Sex, and the Stars. I mean, this book is incredible. Oh, it is. It, it literally is, is no just a masterpiece. Uh, I have it, uh, you could ask my wife, I have it by my desk as a reference 24 7, uh, Jordan. 24 yeah. 7. It does not leave my sight. It's become my own little personal Bible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is magnificent. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you there, there's so much sexual symbolism in the Catholic Church. I mean, oh, yeah. it's incredible. I was looking at some well, of your... Well, actually, there's so much sexual symbolism in all uh, religion. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all based on sex and astrology. Absolutely. That is the basis for all religion in the, in the, in the world we have today uh, connected to Islam, all the different uh, variations of Islam, uh, Christianity, all the different uh, Christian, so-called Christian religions, right. and Judaism is crammed, filled with it. Astrology and sex are the two legs on which all three of those religions stand. Period. Tell me you about it. I was idea. looking. I was looking at your uh, your Facebook page, the Maxwell Files, and I stumbled across a couple of pictures that were very interesting. I mean, you saw the Virgin Mary basically depicted as a clitoris. It was, I'm telling you, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and, and, and I actually also, you need to know this too, that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are all traced back to their parent religion, which was Hinduism. The Hindus gave birth to Christianity, they gave birth to Judaism, and they gave birth to Islam. All three can be traced directly back to to uh, Hindu. Uh, Jordan, to that's, that's very interesting because, you know, I thought something a little different. I thought it was Zoroastrianism. Well, Zoroastrianism, uh, you know, like everything else, anytime you're fixing a big dinner, you're always going to add in a little of this and add in a little of that. <laughs> and eventually, uh, it, you know, it, it accepted uh, the, the three religions uh, commingled and and each one got something from the other and Zoroastrianism is a very big important part of uh, Christianity Judaism and it also has uh, something to do with the Islam but I'm, I'm saying if you go back to day one go back to the very beginning before it started eclectic, you know, the word is eclectic when it begins to pick up other ideas and, and bring them into the religion all three religions can go back to India. I mean, the, and what right. we hear, and here's a here's another point on that, is that uh, we're told that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are Abrahamic religions. All three claim Abraham as their as their father. Well, first of all, there was no Abraham as a man. The man never existed. There was no Abraham, and. And so when you go back into the history of the Jewish religion <clears throat> or Abrahamic religion, you'll find that that uh, it goes back to India and that uh, there was a priesthood that still exists today. There was a priesthood in India a long time ago called Brahmins. And the Brahmins were, uh, they, they were the, the most important uh, trying to say it correctly, the most important priesthood in, in the ancient India. Brahmins were very, very superior to everyone. 
They had nothing to do with the ordinary common people. They looked down upon the common people as untouchables. They were cattle. They were like swine, the, the, the normal people. Uh, so if you were a Brahmin, you were, you, know, you were a very special priesthood that had nothing to do with the common people. They were all a bunch of dogs and animals. Well, Jordan, so, if they were Brahmin, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask you, if they were Brahmin, would, would they somehow be, did they think themselves to be descended to maybe higher beings? Such well, as they, the Elohim, well, or well, they just assumed that they were. Yeah, I'm sure that they probably uh, assumed themselves to have been connected to the ancient gods. And right. Get into that. But the point I'm making is that the Brahmins gave us the word a Brahmin. You put an a in front of it because a Brahmin. Amazing. And therefore, a Brahmin. Uh, and if you go back into the books of Genesis. Uh, about uh, about um, Abraham, that was not his name. His name was Abram. Abram later on had his name changed to Abraham, but originally his name was Abram. And uh, and so you put an A in front of Brahman, and it becomes Abram or Abraham. And um, and his wife in the Old Testament, his wife was Sarah. Well, right, in right. the India, there's a very spiritual, very, very important river called the Saraswati River that the, Abra uh, that the Brahmins held to be very sacred. And so it was the Abrahman and Saraswati River. So today we have Abraham and Sarah. No, Abrahman and Saraswati River. It goes back to India. There was no Abraham. But I'm saying also that there was no Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, uh, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is Brahman, Vishnu, Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, or Osiris, Isis, Horus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Uh, it's always a triune God. It's always three. Exactly. That's why you have the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Why is it divided into three major religions? Because the, 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 the number three is very important in the ancient Brahmin system and in the ancient uh, prehistoric and ancient systems of, of, of religion. Wow. So I'm just saying that you, and when you're looking at religion, you need to go back as far back in, in history as you can possibly go with records and begin to see where the ideas and belief systems have come from, how they mutated or evolved and how they come down to us today. So that I'm saying that I'm saying that everything you read in Judaism, Christianity and Islam is based on Hindu, but all of all of its teachings in those three religions are so filled with mythologies, uh, other other ideas and been thrown in. Uh, it's a very eclectic way of doing things because uh, Islam picks up all kinds of ideas from other cultures and, and weaves it into their religion. So does Christianity and so does Judaism. Absolutely. It's just an amazing story about how these things have been cooked up over thousands and thousands of years. And of course, young people today, being born today, uh, when you're born into the culture, you don't think about the fact that you could have been born in China. Had you been born in China to a Chinese family, you would have been born into that culture. Exactly. And you would have had those belief systems, unless, of course, you had been born in, uh, in Russia, then you would have those kind of, uh, of customs and ideas and belief systems. Unless, of course, you were born in uh, Africa and the jungle, uh, you would have a different viewpoint on religion. Again, it's your, your social environment determines who you are. Period. That's it. Absolutely. I, I've had some of the most powerful people in the world I, uh, that I were friends with. I'm talking about very powerful people, and one of them was a very, very important Jewish man, uh, far more important than you will ever, <laughs> than I can mention. And he said to me, Jordan, when it comes to religion, I much prefer listening to you because I was born an Orthodox Jew. Hmm. But that doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. 
that means that that's who I am because that's the culture I was born into. But that doesn't mean I know anything. I'm just telling you what I happen by chance to have been born into an Orthodox Jewish family. I don't know what it means, really. I don't know where it comes from. Hmm. And so I said, well, I, I appreciate that. And I said, and, and he was a very powerful lawyer. And he said, and so I told him, when it comes to law, I understand law, international law, maritime law. I understand the world of law. But when it comes to law, I would much rather uh, you know, leave it to you. You're the lawyer, not me. So well, I know your subject and you know mine. But that's right. The Talmud is basically a book of laws. You know, that's well, why a lot of the, I think the best lawyers are, are, are Jewish, definitely. You know, Jordan, I recently uh, discovered I was Sephardic, you know, and I have ancestors that were basically uh, assaulted by, by the church during the Inquisition. So, I mean, they were. Uh, it's it's incredible. I've gone back in time. I've done my history, and I know exactly who my enemy is in this present day and time. And it's well, it's really an incredible thing. Out. There's a connection there. There's a connection between what happened back in World War One, World War Two, what's going on today, uh, the the wars in the Middle East. It all has yes. to do with something that happened a long time ago in the Middle East. It's still there. Absolutely. And you know, so many people, they want to say it's a, a Jewish coup d'etat. They want to say it's a yeah. Jewish conspiracy. Well, you know what? I don't, I don't buy that. A lot, of, a lot of these kindergartners out there that are saying they're awake, <laughs> you know, I'm yeah, referring know. to ignoramuses. They want to say that the Rothschilds are, are Jewish. But, you know, they converted later on in life. My wife has a, a friend who married into the Rothschild family, and she'll testify that they were uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant. They're not, they, they, they were not, yeah. they converted later on to, to Judaism. So that's a, that's an absolute fallacy, isn't it, Jordan? Yeah, well, well, look at, you need to go back and look at this whole uh, subject of, uh, I, I go, I go way back and I, uh, I don't even know if we could get into it tonight, but, uh, I go way back on this subject. First of all, all the, the I have Jewish friends all over. My mother was Jewish. But I have a Jewish friend. I've never even thought of myself as Jewish. It doesn't even it means nothing to me. Hmm. But uh, and because you know, I grew up in a Catholic ho uh, household, right. and uh, that's why my family so did I. Catholic. But my mother, but my mother, uh, you know, was was Jewish. So that makes me Jewish. But I don't, I right. don't relate to any of that because I understand the history of where all of this stuff comes from, and so. There's a bigger story here about about religion, about Judaism. Bigger story, and there's a bigger story about Islam. There's a book. There's a, a a two volume set book that you really need to have about Islam. It's probably the most definitive work I have ever seen done anywhere on the earth. It's an incredible book, and you can get it if you want to do it now quickly. You can get it still free on the web as oh, a free wow. ebook, and it's called uh, Moon, M O O N, then hyphen, and the letter O, then a hyphen, and theism. The word theism, Moon O theism, hmm. Moon hyphen O <clears throat> hyphen theism. Moon O theism is about. 13 to, if I'm remembering, 13 to 1500 pages between the two volumes, 750 a piece, something like that. Huge volumes. But it is, it's the most incredible book I've ever picked up on Islam because it examines every tiny facet of Islam, where it came from, where the symbols, the words, the terms, the language, the culture, where the entire religion are actually, in fact, comes from what it actually means, what it's actually saying, mm. and it's an extraordinary book for research. And the, and the incredible part is you get it for free. Uh, just download it, Moon O Theism, and just download I'm, both volumes. I'm doing it right it now. I'm, we're doing it no. right now as as you speak, Jordan. Now, Jordan, speaking of Islam, uh, I know there's a secret society. Islamic Secret Society called the Fruits of Islam, and I was under the impression that it was the Jesuits that helped write the Quran. Is there any validity to that? 
Yeah, I'm sure that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, uh, was very much a part of founding of, uh, of Islam. Uh, there is a there is now um, uh, research has been done in some of the very important uh, Islamic uh, authorities writing, especially in Europe, are talking about the fact that uh, Muhammad, in fact, never lived. There was no man named Muhammad right. who ever lived. <clears throat> it may be like uh, Christianity talking about, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus did this and Jesus did that. Ooh, Jesus, point, Mithra, Dionysus. I mean, yeah, you you explained it all about. in Zeitgeist. Yeah, but I'm just saying that it's not just Zeitgeist. That's history. Go to a library and get a book on the history of Christianity, and you will see that in the Roman Empire at the time that Christianity was developing, we're talking about a couple of thousand years ago, that when Christianity was developing in the Roman Empire, there was a major, major religion in the Roman Empire already there. And that religion was called Mithraism. Most Christians do not realize that Rome had already had a major religion going in the, in the first century, the time that Jesus would have been here, and it was called Mithraism, and Mithra was referred to, referred to as God's son. He was the son of God. He died on a cross. He uh, was dead for three days and rose. He had 12 helpers and 12 followers. Uh, you know, and, and you look at the, go to the encyclopedia and look up Mithraism and read all of the story about the god Mithra. And you will see it's the identical same story of Jesus. Absolutely. <clears throat> so that's how Christianity got to be so important because it was already here. It's already in the empire called Mithraism. So later on, they just changed Mithra to Jesus and keep the same identical religion with the same identical teachings. And therefore, it's referred to today as the Roman Catholic religion. But what people don't realize is the word Catholic is a Latin word, which means universal. All over the world, universal is Catholic. Therefore, air is Catholic. Water is Catholic. Stupidity is Catholic. <laughs> people are Catholic. Dirt is Catholic. Because all of these things exist all over the world. And that's what the word in Latin means. Catholic simply means worldwide, all over the earth. Universal is everywhere. And right. so Rome, you put the word in front of Catholic, Rome. So it's the Roman universal world religion. <clears throat> and we think, we, we would call it Christianity. No, it's a Roman universal religion. It's called the imperial cult of Rome. The Roman religion today we call Christianity, Vatican, Rome, the Holy Father, Pontifex Maximus. So when you're looking at the Vatican and the Catholic Church and Christianity in general, you're looking at a Roman religion, Mithraism, uh, the cult of the emperor, the Holy Father, uh, you know, and, and you the know, very word Pope goes back to Papa. Right. And Papa, uh, you know, in the ancient languages of, uh, of Europe, in that ancient language, Papa meant a door. Well, in point of fact, your papa and your father is the door to life. Wow. You walk through the door of life through your papa, okay? But doors need to have a hinge to be able to open. <clears throat> so the word hinge in Latin is a uh, cardinal. So right. you have a cardinal point on the zodiac, a cardinal point on a, on a uh, map. Because cardinal means a hinge. So the cardinals are the hinges for Papa, the Pope, to open the door to you to the Roman universal world religion, which is based on Mithra, which comes from uh, the ancient, ancient religions of the ancient prehistoric world. So there's nothing really Christian about Roman Catholicism. But then, of course, there's nothing really Christian about the Protestant. Christian religion, nothing. 
because the Protestants were merely protesting the the uh, Roman religion. And they wanted uh, they wanted to have other ideas and concepts brought in, but they kept the same basic pattern: Christianity. Right. So now you have. Catholic Christianity and Protestant Christianity. Then when it comes to America and the Britannia, now you have Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Worldwide Church of God. You have all of these other cults that have broken off of the Protestant Christianity. Bottom line is, after everything is said and done, there is no real legitimate Christianity on the earth today. <clears throat> because it can be traced back to the Roman Empire, and the, the actual religion, which should be uh, being practiced today by all mankind, has been completely hidden from the world of mankind, and that's why there's so much chaos, so many problems and troubles and, and heartache. And, well, they propagate the chaos. <laughs> they propagate the chaos, Jordan, with the television. Well, of course. They, it's it's, it's literally a, a weapon. <clears throat> of course, but it keeps people busy. You know, yes. I, met, I talked with a lady one time who was a very high official in the, in, in the uh, Democratic Party. And she said, uh, and she even mentioned this one time on radio. I heard her talking about it. She said, uh, in the Democratic Party, at the very top, you are taught... You, you understand that you must keep the people uh, uh, in, in chaos. You must keep them fearful. Something terrible is going to happen next week. Something horrible is coming next month. Right. You've got to keep the people agitated and worried, sick, and, and because that way they don't have time to think about what's really going on. That and they got to really keep them, you know. that and they got to keep the people in debt because in Babylon. Well, the the masters knew that if they kept their people in debt, they would work harder. Well, of course, that's what even the British have said. That was a British term. Yes. <clears throat> Keep the people poor, because they become more um, they become more uh, controllable, and they work harder. They have to keep working harder uh, to stay up. You know, to to stay alive, they have to work harder. So, if you start uh, letting them be, uh, you know, letting them be and, and giving them what they work for, then they they will become lazy. Right. So the best way to keep people from becoming lazy is to make them starve so they'll work harder. Wow. It's just an idea, it's just a concept of how to trick people into working harder and making more money for you. All right. No, I <clears> remember <throat> a, a talk we had a year ago, close to two years ago. I mean, you're basically bought and spoken for from the minute you're spoken, I mean, born with with the Social Security. Now, Jordan, you uh, you mentioned all these terms such as the Empire, uh, Roman Empire, and I'm thinking Star Wars. And, you know, okay. it, it's fitting because not only is there a new Star Wars film coming out, but you were actually, I believe, an advisor to George Lucas. Can you tell us no, about that? No. Or no, no, what, what, no. Was, what happened? <laughs> Uh, some people took the picture I've had out there. I had I have lunch with uh, Michael Eisner, the president of Disney, hmm. and George Lucas and a bunch of other people on that level. I had lunch with them out at a special party. But uh, I, in fact, yes. never, in fact, ever had anything to do with uh, with uh, George Lucas's work at all. I admired his work, yes. <clears throat> and we talked about it over lunch. Uh, but I, in fact, never worked with him at all. But that doesn't mean I couldn't. Right. I just never, I never, as a matter of fact, I, I, uh, when I first met him <clears throat> at the party, when I, uh, uh, I, it was a kind of like a, um, it was a very open place, and you, you had food everywhere, so you pick up whatever food you want and go find a place to sit down <clears throat> and have dinner. Well, they had these big, long, wooden tables, uh, like, like uh, what do you call it, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, these long tables, and pick up your food and go sit someplace. So I picked up what I wanted, and I went over to this long table, lots of people there, and sat down because of the open spot, 
And as it turned out, I'm sitting right next to on my right hand side, uh, Michael Eisner, the president of Disney. <clears throat> and directly across from me was, was uh, George Lucas. And there were many other very big names there also. And so I'm sitting here having lunch with them, talking, and, uh, and George Lucas said to me, he said, uh, he introduced himself, I shook his hand, and, and I told him uh, my name, and, uh, and he said, Jordan, you've got a book, it's a red-covered book, and something about the church doesn't want you to read. Hmm. And I said, yes, I do. And I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that you know about that book. <clears throat> and he said to me, Oh, I don't read a lot because I don't have time, but I pay other people, you know, to do that kind of research for me. Right. But my wife particularly made me read your part in that book. She got the book, and she was reading your uh, the stuff you were talking about in the book, and she made me sit down and read your part. That's why I remember the name so well, because I don't read that much. Uh, you know, I have other people doing it, yeah. but I did read your part, and I was very impressed with that. And he said, do you have a business card? And I did. I gave it to him. And then Michael Eisner, at that, you know, I asked, well, what are you talking about? So then... <clears throat> George and Lucas and myself were telling Michael about you know religion and all the stuff I was into. So I was very delighted to be able to, to you know have lunch with the two of them and everybody else that was there. But uh, in point of fact, no, I never worked with him. I would love to. I would love to do that. Well, I'm yeah. sure. I'm yeah. sure they took notes, Jordan, because I mean I see so much occult symbolism in Star Wars, and I know you do too. Uh, well, yeah, yeah there's, I mean, there, a, there's a cult symbolism everywhere. coming directly from me, coming directly from me mm. in a lot of motion pictures, especially I believe in uh, National Treasure 1 and 2 and Da Vinci, a lot of stuff in there came directly from right. me. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you this, though. I mean, the deity, I've su I'm sure you've seen uh, this little, the little green guy in Star Wars, Yoda. Yeah, Yoda. I have yeah. seen him depicted in Eliphas Levi. Uh, yeah, levy course, literature. I mean, that, he's a he's a Rosicrucian deity. Yoda is. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, and uh, you know, one of my dearest friends in this world was Manly P. Hall, and Manly Hall uh, put out a book in which it was it's called the uh, the uh, you know the uh, what was it called the secret teachings, secret teachings of all ages. And in it, a beautiful color picture of little Yoda, uh, and he's explaining Amazing. who he is. You know. Wow. Now, the, could the Jedi be or symbolize Freemasons? I suppose so, and probably a faction, a particular faction of Freemasonry. Um, like I said, Manly P. Hall was one of the foremost authorities on the earth and the, of the occult world. I don't think there was ever a man on the earth that was as brilliant and as profoundly wise <clears throat> and well, uh, you know, well read as uh, Manly Palmer Hall. Oh yes, and, his uh, his uh, works <laughs> on uh, Babylon. Uh, you can take a drink of water if you want, Jordan. Yeah, I know that. I <laughs> no, but his work with uh, Manly P. Hall's work with the whole Babylon series. I mean, I play that from time to time on the station. I mean, it's it's uh, it's pretty riveting. Uh, is that who who did that? That Babylon series. Who hmm. did that? Uh, no, not not Bill Cooper, uh, but I mean, he did a lecture, I believe, Manly, oh, yeah. Manly oh, P. Yeah. Hall did on on the ancient origins of Babylon that I oh, yeah. that I like to listen to uh, in particularly. But um, most important thing in my book that, that Manly P. Hall did for people today to hear is if you go on his website, Manly P. Hall uh, dot org, Manly P. Hall dot org. Um, <clears throat> Is uh, there are eight ninety-minute lectures on astral theology? Right. Those are the most uh, that eight ninety-minute free. They're free. Just go there and listen to them. Are the most important eight lectures I've ever heard anybody do in this world. It's the most important stuff ever. Absolutely. Uh, right. Good groundbreaking. That he explains all of the stuff that going on in, in the concepts and ideas in Judaism. Christianity, all the belief system, where they really come from. It's manlyphall.org. <clears throat> Very simple.
And you know, they have a, I'm out here in Brooklyn, New York, they have a, a museum. I know they have the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles back there with you, but they have a museum, the Manly P. Hall here in New York as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Manly Hall was a, was a very close friend of mine. When he passed away, he left me <clears throat> all of his research journals as a, as a wow. gift to me. I was shocked and amazed when <clears throat> the president of the uh, university called and said, I do, that Manley had passed. And, uh, and he said, uh, well, Manley Hall wanted you to have a, uh, you know, something as a token of his friendship, so come pick it up. And I asked him, what is it? He said, no, just come pick it up. Well, I drove up from San Diego that very day. Right. For, and, uh, and he left me his entire collection of his research work. <clears throat> left it to me, and I, and I was just amazed. You know, that's priceless, absolutely priceless. <clears throat> it truly and, is. Uh, no, it was priceless, and he left it to me. Um, but it's gone now. Somebody uh, burned everything I owned. I, I had in a warehouse. Oh, my burned God. The, burned the warehouse down. I heard about that last year. I heard you were yeah. having some problems, Jordan. And, you know, I, I really uh, hope and, and pray things are, are you know, going well for you and people are listening. If you're tuned in, ladies and gentlemen, uh, buy his books, go to uh, jordanmaxwellshow.com, donate, do everything you can because this is a rare gem. He's a true cavalier in the world of occult symbolism, folks. I mean, you wouldn't have El Gran Montalvo right here if it didn't, if it wasn't for uh, forefathers like Jordan Maxwell in the occult research world. So that's my oh, plug. I it. I thank you. Yeah, but if you go to Jordan Maxwell, that's Jordan like the river, River Jordan Maxwell uh, show, Jordan Maxwell show. Right. <clears throat> because there is a jordanmaxwell.com, but that one doesn't belong to me. That was stolen from me. And so don't go there, jordanmaxwell.com. Leave it alone. It belongs to criminals who stole it from me. Uh, they hacked my old website, Jordan. I, I know how you feel. They, they well, steal things so, all the time, don't they, those bastards? Yeah, well, that's all right. What what goes around <laughs> comes around. They'll get there soon. But anyway, if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, <clears throat> uh, you will see at the top, you'll see a uh, on, on the banner that says Research Society. What that is, is that's my new website, and I just call it a research society. It's just my new website to replace the one that was stolen from me. So I'm downloading all of my work, all the many years of documents and ideas and concepts and systems and where they come from and words and terms and symbols into a whole new website. It's brand new. And so if you want to join, it's right there. Go to Jordan Maxwell Show. And you will see Research Society. Click on it and join. I'm, I'm pouring in all kinds of stuff over the years that I've been collecting. And so I want to put the stuff out there. But incidentally, I do not intend to put my work <clears throat> out into the public any longer. Mm -hmm. I intend to uh, do what I'm doing now is I'm putting it into a, a, a research club so to speak, a research society of sorts, hmm. meaning that I am keeping it private. Uh, you have to join to, to uh, be a part of what I'm doing because I've been giving stuff away <clears throat> since uh, 1967, uh, giving away all the documents and knowledge and everything, and, and I've never gotten anything for it. And now at 75 years old, I can't even afford to keep my website going so I decided to take my work off the uh, public. I mean, there's enough stuff out there already on YouTube and on the web about me and my work. Right. So if you want to get in on my work today and what I'm doing and downloading all the stuff that I'm into, then just join the Research Society. That's all I would say. Absolutely. And I'll, I'm joining today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Join Jordan Maxwell's Research Society. Jordan, I would like to have you on the broadcast uh, as much as possible. I think we're a, we're a great duo. I have a premium outlet with uh, TalkStream Live, very high number of top 50. So 
people are listening. I mean, they've been listening to you, but they're listening to me, and I, I really would like to bring you on more often. Well, let's do it as a regular thing then, you know. I don't wow. Care. Oh, man. Talk about a dynamic duo. Now, let's – we got some more time left. I mean, how much How much time do you, do you have left, Jordan? Would you like to do uh, – Maybe a, another 30 minutes with us? Yeah, we could do another 30 minutes. I have a show at 7.30. Excellent. <clears throat> Excellent. So Great. Well, we let's, go let's go back to uh, Star Wars again and the symbolism that's in Star Wars. You know, I see uh, one of the main uh, antagonists, and that's uh, Darth Vader. I mean, to me, I mean, he, he symbolizes the Nazis. So, hey, that trench coat, the cape, he looks like Goebbels to me or something. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure a lot of that is in there, you know. There's a lot of stuff in, in Star Wars. But the main the main thing that I thought of, about Star Wars is the very name. Yes. Wars in the Stars. Star Wars. And that's, uh, that's in fact, what's going on. There's something going on out there in, in our galaxy, in our solar system. Our, our other planets in our solar system are finally, we're finally getting <clears throat> some people to tell us something about what's going on in our own solar system. Right. And when you begin to look at our planets closest to us, there are all kinds of things that we didn't know, <clears throat> implying that there is uh, other life forms here in our solar system. Uh, I've talked with scientists, very, very well-established scientists at NASA. I'm not going to give their name because they're in trouble now because they've talked too much. But they talked with me privately up in San Francisco. They, uh, and they were talking about we, what we know. The, well, what happened was that <clears throat> the scientist comes walking up to me in San Francisco. I was speaking at a conference there. <clears throat> and he said, Jordan, I've come here to talk to you. I'm not interested to to, to attend this uh, this conference, but I came here to talk to you. And he said, because you've been talking a lot about the planet Saturn in mythology and religion. I wanted to tell you, since you're here <clears throat> in my area, I wanted to tell you a few things about Saturn that we at NASA know that nobody's ever heard. And he began telling me some of, the, some of the strangest stuff about the planet Saturn. <clears throat> and that uh, basically uh, that the planet Saturn is inhabited. Right. There's, there's life forms there. We know wow. they're there because we've seen them. And then uh, the North Pole of Saturn is a hexagon. And uh, we, so the, we've seen also, we've seen large ships. Uh, one in particular, large, very large ship, he said it's estimated to be about 3,200 miles wide from Los Angeles to New York. Well, that's how big this thing is. <clears throat> and it is creating another ring around Saturn because the rings around Saturn are artificial. They're not normal. Somebody's making those rings. And there's a ring being made right now as we speak, and it's almost completed. And so wow. they've got pictures as they flew by Saturn. They've got pictures of this huge ship that's estimated to be 3,200 miles wide, creating another ring around Saturn. And uh, and it's almost done. They can see where it started, and now it's almost connected, but it's not yet connected. And so they know, and then he said, we've seen and got pictures of, of ships going into Saturn, actually going into the planet, not landing on the planet, but going into it. Right. And ships coming out of the planet, coming out of and going into. So we know there's activity there on Saturn. What it is, who it is, we don't know. But there's activity there. I should tell you something. And then, of course, when you look at the surface of Mars and begin to see the incredible stuff that we... Oh, you see infrastructures. The infrastructure yes. of Mars. <clears throat> the uh, the glass tunnels. 
satellites of, even. Yeah, it's incredible. The, the stuff that is on Mars that obviously is not natural. Somebody made them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now and we begin Blue to skies. Look at, they even have yeah. blue skies on Mars. Yeah. But my point is, it's highly intelligent out there. And they're on Mars. We know that for a fact. We've seen too much. They're on the moon. We've seen that too much. Uh, there, there's life on the planet Saturn. We've seen that. Uh, so uh, basically uh, what I'm saying is that our solar system is alive and teeming with, with life forms which are far superior to us, highly intelligent and far superior to us because they can do things we can't do. <clears throat> and so uh, it, it all implies that these are the same intelligences that have given us our religions and our philosophies and and our uh, mythologies of our religions. Where did all of these stories come from? Well, it goes back to the ancient world, when this world, and even today, but this world has been occupied by higher intelligences. We call them demons or gods or <clears throat> archons or whatever, whatever you want to call Nephilim, them. Archon. Yeah, Nephilim, archon. <clears throat> Nephilim, right. And the Mormon religion. If you look at the uh, Nephites and the, and the Mormon books and magazines, you see pictures of what they call the Nephites. And the Nephites are huge, enormous, uh, uh, overly uh, normal human, large, huge guys, you know, big, huge, well, enormous. Like, like the Amalek. <clears throat> exactly. And so, uh, but Nephites, well, you know, Nephites, put that in front of the word Nephilim. Nephilim, wow. yes. the Nephilim were the offspring of, of, uh, of the fallen angels with, with humans. Uh, that's a whole story you can go into for hours on that subject. And so, right. <coughs> people oh, it do truly not know is. how to read any of this stuff. It truly is a intergalactic star war. And that's right. Jordan, you know, I, I was looking at, I like to look at the symbolism or the predictive programming from Hollywood. And, um, <laughs> We'll get into that in, in just a little bit. Just wanted to mention in the, for in the new Star Wars movie, I mean, the symbol of the, the Sith, who I believe represent the Jesuits, is actually a, a Vatican Knights of Malta cross. I mean, the lightsaber is a Knights of Malta cross. I was blown away when I saw that symbolism. Well, first of all, you need to understand that ABC or Disney, Disney bought ABC. Yes. Disney is uh, filled <clears throat> to the brim. I'm talking about filled to the brim with Illuminati occult symbolism, words, and, t and it's just pouring out. Yes. Pouring out into the world occultism on a level and, and uh, amounts in a level that's un. Believable. Well, they talk about there the magic of Disney. <clears throat> yeah, but but I'm saying it's really very dark. Yes. I'm talking about something different than just the slipping in symbolism of ancient religions and all that kind of thing. No, I'm talking about something different. What I'm talking about is a profound, awesome outpouring of of uh, seditious. Incredible propaganda <clears throat> based uh, directly on uh, the Illuminism, Illuminati symbolism from the 1600s, 1700s, uh, the dark uh, occult symbolism going back into yes. the, uh, the, the devil worship and demon worship, going back into the Middle Ages. I mean, there's a lot of very, very powerful, scary stuff going on at Disney and ABC that people just don't know about. They don't see it. Jordan, they literally <laughs> have 666 on the Disney logo. No, that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm talking about. And right about. in the castle, I've seen so much uh, symbolism, I mean, from ISIS and the pillars of masonry, both Jacking and Boas. I mean, it's all over their, their work. <clears throat> well, it's sexual said. symbolism. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I saw the Lion King, and I didn't yeah. notice it right away.
But Simba goes and he lays down on the grass, the lion Simba. And from the embers or the dust where he lays down on the rock, they go up into the sky and they spell up s sex. That's right. And that goes into the subconscious. I mean, it, Walt Disney even had a personal relationship with, uh, I believe it was J. Edgar Hoover, and he was even being brainwashed or mind controlled at military bases like Lookout Mountain or Laurel Canyon. I mean, these places in Hollywood that are part of the druidical occult, uh, just cabal. Yeah, well, you know, I lived in Los Angeles, uh, you know, in. Yeah, me too. Studio City was uh, was walking distance to me, and uh, Laurel Canyon. That's a whole story in itself. Laurel yes. Canyon and uh, Studio City in uh, in the out in the uh, outskirts of Los Angeles, out in the valley, it's called, and uh, that's where Nazism was born. We think that Nazism was a creation of the Germans during the Second World War, and point of fact, no, that's not true at all. Nazism was born in, in uh, Studio City in Los Angeles. It was born there. That's where it was created, uh, up on, up on uh, Laurel Canyon and uh, <clears throat> Mulholland. Right. Up near the Mulholland and Laurel, where Laurel crosses Mulholland, was a hotbed of occultists and, uh, and Houdini and a lot of other people live right up in that area. But it was a hotbed for occultism. And they developed, uh, that's a whole story in itself. I mean. well, absolutely. They developed, Jordan, just uh, the artists, the legendary rock stars of today, that's all of right, them. Exactly. I mean, from Red Hot Chili Peppers to Jim Morrison, whose father was part of the Gulf of Tonkin. I mean, they, they all had military ties and they all had this occult tie to I, what I believe in my research to the process church. It all goes back to that, I believe. Well, I had a friend who passed away quite a few years ago. This was a long time ago. <clears throat> and uh, he was a limo driver and, uh, and with the studios. And he was telling me, I used to go with him sometimes when he was driving movie stars around. But he was telling me that he at one time he got a um, a call to pick up a very famous movie star. I'm not going to use his name. <clears throat> and he said that he had a couple of other people with him and picked him up at the airport to bring him back to Hollywood. And he said, and as they were driving back on the freeway, this this very famous movie star asked uh, asked the driver because he knew him well. <clears throat> he said, who do you think is the most wealthiest man on the whole planet Earth? the most powerful, wealthiest man on the earth. And and my friend said, I, so I just give him the, the same name that any other goofball would. I said, Rockefeller and everybody else. The guys <laughs> there laughed. They thought it was funny. <clears throat> I said, the Rothschilds, and then they laughed again. They thought that was funny. <laughs> and then the guy said, then the, the movie star said, no, I'm serious. Who do you think is the most uh, wealthiest, most powerful man on the planet? And he said, I have no idea. And he said, well, that's where we're going. He lives right here in Los Angeles in the Hollywood Hills off of Mulholland. And he's a German. He's the one that gave us the German, the Germanic idea of Nazism. He's the guy who finances all of that kind of stuff for Adolf Hitler. We're wow. going to see him today. And so uh, he went on to telling me about all kinds of where this guy lived up in the mountains. And uh, out of hills in the hills of Los Angeles. But the point I'm making is that there's a lot of things going on on this earth that we have no idea in the world where they come from, who did it, where it started. And so we just go along to get along and believe whatever we're given to believe, never realizing nothing is what you think it is. The whole thing is a charade and a show. Tell me and about it's it. always based on political power. Politic, you know, religion is simply a tool in the hands of the people who run the planet. I mean, Hollywood truly <laughs> is a, a freak kingdom, is it not, Jordan? Well, of course. I mean, let's let's look at let's look at the the word well, Hollywood let's itself. Let's look at where the Hollywood. Word yes, yeah, that's exactly. You see, we're going the we're going the same place. The word yeah. the word Holly, Hollywood. Where is it derived from? Right. It it's, comes from. An old in the ancient uh, Europe, 
the, the Druids. The, before the Roman Empire existed, before Rome, in Europe there was already a well-established uh, peoples in Europe and central and northern, well, all four, north, east, west, and southern Europe, there were already lots of people there. And that system, before Rome existed, that system was called Druids, yes. the Druidic system. The Druids were a Celtic or a Celtic peoples, and a European peoples, and in that system we called Druid. The Druids were the doctors, the lawyers, the politicians, the teachers, any any uh, any position that was important in the ancient world in Europe was was occupied by a druid. Well, the druids had a very important symbol that they carried with them always, and uh, <clears throat> that symbol was a magic wand. That's right. Like uh, today, today you have uh, orchestra leaders who conduct their orchestra, they orchestrate the music, orchestrating with a magic wand. That's right. Just like Merlin the Magician orchestrates his magic with a magic wand. That all goes back to the Druid magic wand of Europe. And so magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly. That's bush, right. Holly tree. And so it was always made out of a holly wood. Right. I mean so the the Freemason, you know, the Freemason used wands, well, right? But but I'm talking about an ancient, far far before Freemasonry ever existed. I'm talking about a a, a culture of people called the Druids, and they had a right. system of magic. And over that magic, they use a symbol to manipulate that magic called a magic wand. Right. <clears throat> and today. Uh, people do not realize that in Christianity and in Judaism virtually every time you will see a picture or a sculpting or a picture of Moses he always carried a magic wand uh, anytime in the churches of Europe throughout all of Europe uh, when you see the uh, sculpting and pictures of Jesus doing miracles. He's always doing a miracle with a magic wand everywhere. Right. People do not realize that, that there are many sculpturing all over Europe and Christian cathedrals and churches showing or painted pictures showing Jesus doing his miracles with a magic wand. Go on the web and type in magic wands with Jesus or magic wands in, uh, with Moses. And you will see all kinds of sculptures where Moses is doing magic with his magic wand, or Jesus is, is uh, raising the dead, or doing some incredible, uh, you know, incredible thing with his magic wand. Right. I am telling you that the entire story of Judaism and Christianity is druidic. It goes back to the use of magic wands Yes. All you've got to do is go on the web to and, and <clears throat> go on the web and type in image. You know, go to image and then type in magic wands uh, with Moses, magic wands, and Jesus. Right. And then you will see all kinds. Saint Peter was carrying a magic wand and did magic with his magic wand. Mm -hmm. uh, People are not told this kind of thing. They don't know anything about it. They yep. all they know is they go to church and have no idea in the world Absolutely. Where, where church comes from. Right. Uh, so, where does the word church come from? I've heard you break that down before. Yeah, well, people go to church and have no idea that the word church <clears throat> goes back to a it's a it's obviously an English word. C H U R C H church is English. <clears throat> but it is traced back to, in a dictionary, it goes back to Scotland. Hmm. In Scotland, if you are a Christian, Sunday morning you're going to Kirk, K-I-R-K, -K, or K-E-R-K. -K. Kirk can be spelled either way. This is why you have a, uh, a Captain Kirk of the good ship Enterprise. Big ticket, mankind ah. where you've never been before. Because wow. that's what Captain Kirk 
Kirk is church in English. And that's why churches are an enterprise. That's why the spaceship is called enterprise, because churches are divided into denominations, like 20s and 10s and 50s. It's an enterprise. It's a company. It's a corporation. It's money. It's political power and business. Absolutely. And so, uh, and of course, the whole world is a business. You are a corporation. My God, that's, that's so much you never, people don't know. Did you know that you yourself are a corporation by law? Absolutely. I'm being sold. You're being sold. We're all being sold on the uh, <laughs> Wall Street, New York Stock Exchange as collateral right. for, for the debt, Jordan. That's you know, exactly right. we, let, we, me, let me go, go on ahead. with this. Go ahead. When I see you with some girl and I tell you the next day, you know, that girl you were out with last night, she's bad company. <laughs> company? Then you say to me, mind your own business. Business? Right. I'm going to get married. She's going to be my partner. Partner? Business? Company? I We're talking business All here. business terms, yes. It's all business terms. Why? Because getting married is simply a business. And tell me about and, it. <laughs> and and therefore, if the marriage doesn't work, it's all right. Businesses don't always work. So if the business doesn't work, it was bad business or it was monkey business. Usually. But it's <laughs> none of my business. That's your business. That is so, truly and funny. So, but if you're going to do business with somebody else, another corporation, you're going to have to have a license. So that's why you have to have a marriage license because you're doing business. If you don't think you're doing business then wait till it don't work out because you're not going to God, you're going to court. Bring your car, your house, and your money. It's right. just business. Oh, and there's so much of um, wordplay with regarding, I've heard you break it down, the, the water gate in court. Oh, and, of course. Yeah, I, I've heard it. You know, Jordan, I, um, I even I have a magic wand. Do you know that? Well, I had one too. <laughs> I, have a, I have a scalar wand, actually. I've been looking into it. Uh, actually, there the tip of the wand is is uh, filled with quartz and actually has healing energies i mean this is this is no joke this is like tesla technology and and it has cured me in the past i remember uh last year or close to two years ago i had a, a steel beam literally fall on me and i mean i i came my wife saw me and she saw i was literally a mess i looked like one giant bruise and uh bruce looked like a bruise so, uh, you know, she she gave me some of this treatment with the scalar wand and, you know, wouldn't you know, I, I was like Superman uh, a month, two months into it. It well, just went away. I'm just telling you, there Amazing. is something to all of this. Magic. Yep. Yeah. Incredible. Some incredible healing magic. Jordan, uh, we were talking about Hollywood and the symbolism of... Uh, just surrounding Hollywood, uh, the Oscars. The Oscar yeah. looks like the Egyptian deity Horus or Ptah, does he not? Yeah, Ptah. Yeah. Uh, that's where it comes from. Yeah. <clears throat> and on my website, I've got a picture of the, um, oh, what is it called? The uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, oh, it's on my website. Anyway, Right. It's called the Academy of, uh, of Arts and Sciences or something. Uh, but take the first letter in each word and it, it becomes Satan, S-A-T-A-N. Wow. Uh, yeah, and it's on my website. So uh, I sh uh, there's, like I said, there's interwoven into corporate logos, flags, coats of arms, halitry, seals, presidential seals. The police department badges, fire department seals, all of the all the seals and, and emblems and uh, official, uh, like I said, uh, you know, commercial logos for companies and corporations. All of these things are connected behind the scenes with occultism, occult religions, secret societies, fraternal orders are operating right in front of you and you don't even see it. But you they have to understand the language. You have to learn the language of symbolism, don't you not? Do you not? That's right. 
exactly right. You have to learn the language and understand the symbolism. And that's what people do not know. They, 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 most people do not even realize there is a hidden world of communication among powerful people. When the President of the United States is talking, he is not talking to the country. He is not talking to Americans. He is talking to other leaders of the gangs. It's like gang leaders. And they're all talking to each other in their language, not yours. Uh, they're all organized crime scum, and I'm I'm just so sick of them, Jordan. I mean, seriously, I hate I hate listening to politics. I'd much rather talk about what you and I are talking about. You know, it just I, I cannot stand talking about just uh, the, who who the president is because at the end of the day, he's just a puppet. He's being told by the the powers that be, you know, what to do. He's just a puppet on a string. Well, of course, but I thought everybody knew that. <laughs> uh, That's right. I mean, John F. Kennedy proved that. Here's John F. Kennedy back in the early 60s who was handsome, debonair, incredibly wealthy, powerful young man with a powerful family behind him becomes president of the United States and is well loved and respected around the world. He had everything and yet they blew his head off in public. Well that was and nobody, uh and nobody ever went to jail. Period. That was a Freemasonic uh, ritual, I believe. Well I don't know, but I'm just not right. making the point that you can be powerful, you can be wealthy, you can yes. be important, it don't matter. There are powers above you that will kill you at a drop of a hat. Period. Yes. So just because you are, uh, are Albert Einstein or a, or a Rockefeller does not mean anything. Well, like I heard you That's say, are, I heard you say, Jordan. Above them. I heard you say that you know it's the smart people that they go after. That if you're wise, you you know you better you know smarten up and shut up sometimes, right? right. That's what they say. They go after the, well, the smart ones. I didn't ones. say that. The president of the United States said that. Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, back in 19, I think it's 1919, made the statement, right. public statement, that there is a power on this earth so awesome, so powerful, I'm paraphrasing. That's right. So awesome and so terrible and so profoundly powerful that if you're going to speak about it, you better speak under your breath so nobody hears you. Because if you offend them, you are dead. I don't care if you're the President of the United States, you're dead before the sun goes down. So there is a very powerful presence in the earth that's where the real power exists. It does not exist in the U.S. government. It doesn't exist in Russia or in the Vatican. There's something else going on here that's manipulating all of it. And that's why the Apostle Paul in the Bible says we wrestle not uh, with flesh and blood. We don't have a war against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and dark evil forces in the world that you can't see. That's what we're really and with those, at war with. Would those evil forces lead to Rome? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Rome is one of the major, one of the three major divisions of that dark force. It's not the only one, but it's it's one of the earliest and most important uh, factions of that dark power. But there is a power behind the Vatican. Yeah. The Vatican itself is not the power. The Vatican merely represents something that's behind it. Just like the president is not the power in this country, it never has been. He merely represents uh, a power source in Washington, D.C., but there's something that's behind it that he represents. He's not the power, but he represents the power. Well, the same thing with the Pope. The Pope is not the power. The Popes can be killed. My God, there's been plenty of them killed. And some of them just get so, uh, get so dirty that they have to quit. You know, Jordan, so. you, you mentioned the Pope, and re when he was here recently, I, I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral, uh, I believe a week before the Pope was there. And I took a look around, and I saw so much occult symbolism, not just around Rockefeller Plaza that has, uh, that has oh, yeah, Prometheus. Prometheus and Atlas 
And but in front of the St. Patrick's Cathedral, and I made a video about this. There's uh, Kali. There was Buddha. I mean, it seemed like the perfect place for the false prophet of hope, the false idol. This this dope to show up and and give this just uh, the perfect place for his idolatry. Yeah, well, I mean, the first time uh, the Pope came to New York after 9-11, the Pope came to uh, Ground Zero. Uh, he came on the 20th of April, April 20th. Uh, April 20th uh, is, is the day the Pope came to visit Ground Zero. I think that's interesting. interesting. April 20th, Hitler was born on April 20th. Absolutely. Does that tell you something? So, wow. Uh, and so... No, you know, and, you know it, and why did they call it Ground Zero? Exactly. Why is that place in New York where the World Trade Center stood called Ground Zero? Oh, it does tell me something, Jordan. It tells me that 9-11 was a Nazi job. And if we go back and we study who allowed the Nazis to escape persecution, escape justice, they escaped through the Vatican rat lines, through, through the Pope, through Pope Pius, who gave his final order and even initiated the death camps in the sequence of a pentagram. Yeah. And many death camps were had this hidden symbolism. I saw a picture on your Jordan Maxwell Files uh, profile page on Facebook. It had one of the concentration camps was actually the Eye of Horus. Yep, you got it. That's exactly right. So all of this stuff is mixed in in such a way that nobody sees it. That's why the Bible has... It's terrifying. Has, that's why the Bible says that you look with your eyes, but you do not see. And you listen with your ears, but you do not hear. And wow. with your heart, you do not get the sense of it. What it's saying is you're looking at the stuff every day, you're hearing it every day, and you don't get the sense of it. You don't see it. Right. That's why people, you know, that's why people today do not see what's right in front of them. And that's right funny because, but the point I was making about, the, about <laughs> no, the point I was making yes. about Ground Zero is that's a term used for the atomic bomb. Wow, the atomic bomb was where it was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and where it was tested in White Sands, New Mexico. They called that that the term was Ground Zero. Ground Zero means where the atomic bomb blew up. Absolutely. Now, why would they call the World Trade Center area Ground Zero? Is that a message there? Are they telling you something? Ground Zero atomic bomb? Yes. Wow. Is the future plans probably predictive programming for the future or today? Well, well it's, it's, you know, the world we live in is just interesting. I mean, thank God. For me, uh, they... they People are always telling me, oh, well, people are waking up and things are going to be better. People are waking up. And to which I say that's what people normally do in prison, in, in Auschwitz and in prisons. People wake up every morning in prison. Wow. But just because they're waking up doesn't mean they're free and out of the best. No, they're just waking up to find out they're locked in forever. So with the people who are waking up today to find out what's going on, they don't realize it's way too late, way too late. So the uh, for me, the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming. You should have woke up a long time ago, back in the 1870s is when we needed to wake up. Oh, yeah. This stuff has been going on since the 1880s, 1870s. And it was going on <clears throat> in the 1870s. 40s before these the uh, that's when all of this stuff that we're experiencing today started back in the 1840s 1845 go back and look at American history that's when all of this dark stuff started happening right after the Republic was founded in 1776 that's right there no, was a it's... whole new uh, thing coming happening it was very evil uh, as far back as the uh, <clears throat> 1840s so People should have woke up alone. Oh, it's, it's become a dire situation, Jordan. Yeah, and uh, literally, uh, you know, there's there's no escape on the on Earth.
from the New World Order's electric eye. I mean, they... No, no, they there is no escape, period. Yes. Period. You know, and before we go, Jordan, it's been an epic All Hallows Eve with the legend himself, Jordan Maxwell, acclaimed researcher and scholar. Before we go, Jordan, I've always wanted to ask you this question. Uh, I've heard you say this phrase, the dawn of a new era. Can you explain that for us? No. And the reason why is because it's hmm. a huge subject. It's enormous. <laughs> and it's actually a dawn of a new day. Dawn of a new day. That's right. And that is a very big subject. Then we'll, we'll talk about that definitely for, the, <laughs> well, for next that, time. That's going to take about five hours of <laughs> video. Of video. Wow. You cannot discuss it. Okay, it's a, it's we a, could. It's a kind of a it's right. a kind of a subject that is so big you'd have to see it from the very beginning, going back to the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, the Assyrians, Babylonians, the Jordan, Hindus. Could that it's be a very ancient subject? Could that be? I mean, just to hint at it a little bit, just the the symbolism in the Japanese flag pretty much hints at it, right? The rising sun or the. Yeah, I know, but it's it's a far far bigger story. Wow. Far bigger. It goes back to. The beginnings of mankind. It's a big, big story that no one has ever been told. Amazing. It's always, it's right there in front of you. Anyway, I'm going to have to go because i got a new show to do right Excellent. now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jordan, for being on. It's been great catching up with you. I'm, I feel so enlightened and uh, happy All Hallows Eve and uh, yeah, festivities you to you too. Thank you. And go on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show, and Join my research society. We'll talk later. You got it. Take it Bye -bye. easy, Jordan. Bye. That was the legend himself in the flesh, baby, Jordan Maxwell. This has been another episode of the Bruce Montalvo Show, reminding you that the freedom of the press is here and alive. At the epicenter of cool Brooklyn, New York, I'm Bruce Montalvo signing out. Till next time. Hey! <laughs>